good morning everybody I'm up at Boot Lake Nature Preserve today and it's taken me a while this morning to find a good spot so I hope you'll pardon some of the shadows and whatnot now that's getting later in the year the Sun is lower in the sky and it casts shadows here in the woods <laughs> it's hard to get in a spot where there's not branches or something in the way Anyhow, we are in Numbers chapter 4 today. Now, the last chapter uh, spoke about numbering the three families of the Levites and their placement around the tabernacle and all that. Now, this chapter actually designates men from each family of the Levites here, which was Kohath, Gershon, and Merari. And it designates men from those tribes that were numbered out before, from a month old and upward. It singles out those between the ages of 30 and 50. This is for those that will be carrying the implements of the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, and everything else. And it had to be men between the ages of 30 and 50. There's a whole lot of deep meaning in this chapter. You know, on the surface, it doesn't look like much. It just looks like, you know, designating what they're going to carry and things like that. But there's a lot in it. Let's get right into it. This is Numbers chapter 4, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families, by the house of their fathers, from 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, when it says host like that, it's usually referring to some type of uh, warfare or something like that, you know, like the angelic hosts battle against the hosts of darkness and whatnot. The same thing when they go into battle. You know, when men go into battle, it's called a host. All right? So here, that's what he's naming these. Now, they're Levites. They don't actually go into battle. They don't go to war. But they have the task of transporting all the holy things of the tabernacle. And it has to be done just in a certain way, you know. Now, there's another passage later on in Numbers chapter 8 where it speaks about that once they hit the age of 25, these Levites, then they would wait at that point. They would maybe go into a period of training or something like that is what it sounds like. Numbers 8.24 says, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites, from twenty and five years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, which they weren't eligible to do until they were thirty. So it sounds like that period between twenty-five and thirty, maybe they were in training, they were in preparation, uh, they were learning. And it's like this today, too, for Christian appointments in the church, isn't it? There's always a time of preparation, you know. It's not usually where a person will get saved, come into the family of God, and then right away they'll be appointed to some role in the church. That's not usually how it is. There's usually a period of learning and uh, communion with the Lord and, and just learning, you know. <laughs> I know there was for me. Now, in 1 Timothy... Chapter 3, verse 6, the Apostle Paul talks about this in writing to Timothy, and he says that anybody appointed to the service in the church, he's speaking about the office of a bishop here, to be specific, and he says that that person should not be a novice. In other words, they shouldn't be uh, brand new, green, or wet behind the ears, you know, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So this was a period of preparation for them. And those over 50 must have been considered uh, unfit for service. 
just because they're getting older in life because all these things were very heavy to carry and they walked for long distances in the wilderness. Verse 4, this shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. Now remember, there was three sons of Levi. There's the Kohath, Gershon, and Merari. And in the last chapter, it separated those out and numbered them. Well, now it goes by each one here what they're to do. And when the camp setteth forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. All right. Now we saw in the last chapter that the sons of Kohath, their task was to carry all the furnishings of the temple. The ark of the covenant, the altar of burnt offering, the, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the lamp, all that all those things were for the Kohathites to transport. Now it says here that when they got ready, that Aaron and his sons, just those three, who were the designated priests, they were the ones to take the covering veil down and to cover the ark with the veil. Now see here, we see Aaron's sons involved in this because somebody had to do it. Only Aaron, the high priest, was able to go into the Holy of Holies where the ark was, and that was just once a year. It had to be done very specifically. Now here, when they moved, it required more than one. So the Lord allowed this for them to take the veil down and cover the ark, just Aaron and his sons. And of course, at that time, the cloud would be lifted off the tabernacle. Remember, it had a pillar of cloud which would come down and be over the ark when they were camped. But then when it was time to move, that cloud would be lifted up. So I would assume at that time that the Shekinah glory that was surrounding the ark would probably be lifted also so that they could safely go about their task of covering the ark. Verse 6, And shall put thereon the covering of the badger skins over the veil. They cover the ark with a veil, then they'd put badger skins over that, and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue, and shall put in the staves thereof. The staves were the sticks that went in the rings on the ark that they would carry it with. Okay? So there were three coverings over it. There was the veil first, and then the badger skins, which was a type of weatherproofing, because while they were moving, it would be out in the elements. And over that was a blue cloth. So it looked blue. Isn't that interesting? Then I think all these colors have symbolic meaning also. Maybe that because it's the Ark of the Covenant. And blue is the color of the sky. You know? Which separates us from the Lord who is above. Figuratively, you know? Maybe literally like the curtain of the blue sky that spread out between us and God. Verse 7, And upon the table of the showbread they shall spread a cloth of blue also, and put thereon the dishes and the spoons, after the covering of blue was put on, and the bowls, and covers to cover withal, and the continual bread shall be thereon. So the bread would stay there. And they shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet. Isn't that interesting? Of red to cover the table of the showbread. And cover the same with a covering of badger skins and shall put in the staves thereof. The badger skins were always there as a weatherproofing thing. Now here they were covered with scarlet, which is the color of the blood, right? Because this is the bread. And the Lord Jesus is the bread of life, right? Who shed his blood for us. So that's what I see in that, as far as the covering being red. Now that had the staves also. It had the rings on the sides of the table where the staves would go in, these long sticks 
that they would carry it with. And they shall take a cloth of blue and cover the candlestick of the light and his lamps and his tongs and his snuff dishes and all the oil vessels thereof wherewith they minister unto it. I think it's interesting that it says his there as if the light is a living thing. Jesus is the light of the world. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure why it says his there. But that's interesting that that's covered with blue also. The light. And they shall put it and all the vessels thereof within a covering of badger skins and shall put it upon a bar. Now that's a little bit different there. A bar. I'm not sure how that worked. Maybe there were rings or hooks or something on it where the the lamp would hook onto the bar in some way. And upon the golden altar, now this is the altar of incense, upon the golden altar they shall spread a cloth of blue. The incense rises, right, into the blue sky. Cover it with a cloth of blue, and cover it with a covering of badger skins, and shall put to the staves thereof, once again, the poles to carry it with. Now, another thing that I thought of right here, with the lampstand especially, uh, the coverings that cover these things uh, sort of picture the concealment of the things of God, the concealment of of light and all those things and the presence of God how how it was concealed it's made more apparent to us now in the age that we live than what it was back then but it seems like this was some type of a symbolically concealing it from the view of just the the common people the rest of the tribes and even the Levites themselves uh, Kohath, they had to be very careful in transporting the things of the Lord here, the holy things. They weren't to look on any of it. So all these things were covered by the priests before they would transport them. But yes, the holy things of God were concealed during that time. They weren't made apparent and really available to everybody. As much as they are now, there's still things that are concealed now, of course. But there's much more that has been revealed in our time than what was revealed to them back then. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 7, the prophet speaks a little bit of this. He says, and he, speaking of the Lord, will destroy in this mountain, he's talking about Mount Zion, the face of the covering cast over all people. And the veil that is spread over all nations. Now this is prophetic of the last days. And at that time it could even be prophetic of when Christ would come the first time. How a lot of things were revealed at that time. To destroy the face of the covering cast over all people. And the veil that spread over all nations. Yeah. There's just so much in this. Verse 12. And they shall take all the instruments of ministry, wherewith they minister in the sanctuary, and put them in a cloth of blue, and cover them with a covering of badger skins, and shall put them on a bar. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar, and spread a purple cloth, thereon. Now why is the altar covered with a purple cloth? Well, purple usually signifies royalty, the royalty of the ultimate sacrifice. Maybe. Verse 14, and they shall put upon it all the vessels thereof, wherewith they minister about it, even the censers on the altar. Censers, the flesh hooks, the
the shovels and the basins, all the vessels of the altar, they would put on the altar itself. And they shall spread upon it a covering of badger skins and put to the staves of it. And once again, that's the poles for carrying it. So the badger skins were on everything, and that was just to protect these holy things of God from the elements as they were being transported. Now, one thing I saw here is this is the same way for us in our lives here in traveling through our wilderness, right? There's different ways that we're to be covered too, you know, with our physical clothing, of course, but then we're to be covered with the anointing, with the Holy Spirit that is upon us and within us to carry us through our wilderness. Yeah, verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of the covering of the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward, after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. But they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. All they were to touch was the staves there, which was to carry these things. They were not to touch them. They'd be covered so they couldn't see them, you know, lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, this here made me think of how wherever we go in our life, we're to take all the things of our faith with us. You know, when we leave our homes, we don't leave our faith there. We take everything with us. <laughs> and we don't neglect any part of it. We're to be instant in season and out of season. Always ready. Now, another thing I notice here is how the symbols of God's presence in this world, the physical symbols of it, are, are movable, you know, but what we're looking forward to, what we're traveling toward, is a kingdom that can't be moved, right? It's immovable. Only these physical things here are movable. But the eternal kingdom is steadfast forever. Yeah. Now, in thinking about that and taking our faith with us, kind of carrying, you know, our tabernacle, with us in a way the tabernacle also pictures our body you know because the holy spirit resides within us but in walking out here into the woods today i was thinking how you know i'm going out and i'm looking for a spot wherever the spirit leads me to minister the word of god and he always leads me to a spot that feels right and I have all my stuff with me. I have my bag. I have a tripod bag that I take with me. And my tripod is in here. The camera's in here and everything. And I strap this on my back. And then I have my walking stick. I always have my walking stick when I go out here because I walk for miles, you know. And to navigate through small paths and up and down hills and things like that. So likewise, when they carried the tabernacle, they, they had these holy things that they took with them that had to do with the ministry and with God's presence here on earth. So likewise, when I come out here, I, I carry all these things with me and then set them up. Like right now, I have the tripod set up and my camera and everything, and I'm in this place here speaking the word of God but it's temporary then this will be taken down and I'll pack it all up a certain way and I'll take it back with me God's word is so awesome there's so many things in it that we can relate to our own lives individually you know verse 16 and to the office of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, 
pertaineth the oil for the light, Eliezer was to take care of this, and the sweet incense and the daily meat offering and the anointing oil and the oversight of all the tabernacle and of all that therein is in the sanctuary and in the vessels thereof. The Levites weren't to touch any of those things. Only the priests could handle, you know, the anointing oil and things like that. Those who've been anointed and designated to handle it. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Cut ye not off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites, but thus do unto them that they may live and not die when they approach unto the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint them every one to his service and to his burden, and they shall not go in to see when the holy things are covered, lest they die. All right? So he's saying, be careful with the family of the Kohathites. When he says, cut ye not off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites by allowing them to see any of these things because they were forbidden to see it. And then they would die. This was a very serious thing. So the priests had to make sure, which there were only three of them at that time, they had to make sure that everything was covered and everything was ready for them to come in. And then they were to appoint who was to carry each thing when they came in. And they were to be instructed very specifically how they were to handle them. And another thing that I thought of here is how the congregation itself was unable they were forbidden to see or understand the holy things of God isn't that interesting it's not like that anymore either only those that were designated were able to see or to understand it which at that time it would have been you know just the three priests and Moses so you know we think of faith as being a New Testament type term. But it's not really. It goes through the entire Word of God because here, the people, just the average people, say people that were from, say, the tribe of, of Judah or the tribe of Benjamin or any of the other tribes, they were not able to see or touch any of these things or to, even to understand a lot of these holy things. They were just to listen to what the commandment was and they were to obey unquestioningly that took great faith you know it really took greater faith than what what's required of us now because so much has been revealed to us in the age of grace that wasn't revealed to them back then so we're privileged in this way of course faith is still necessary but it's definitely not a New Testament thing. These people, these men and women of God, in those days, before the Lord Jesus came, they required great faith to walk in the ways of the Lord and to do what he desired for them to do. They just had to unquestioningly obey without necessarily understanding or, or anything. You know, but now the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yeah, it's no longer hidden to us in any way. We no longer have to have uh, a priest to go before us because the Lord Jesus is our priest the Son of God himself. Verse 21, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershon, throughout the houses of their fathers, by their families, from thirty years old and upward until fifty years old shalt thou number them. All that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the service of the families of the Gershonites, to serve 
and for burdens, okay? They shall bear the curtains of the tabernacle. Remember? We talked about that in the last chapter. They, they were to carry all the fabrics, the curtains of the tabernacle, and the tabernacle of the congregation, his covering, and the covering of the badger skins that is above upon it, on the roof, and the hanging for the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the hangings of the court, and the hanging for the door of the gate of the court, which is by the tabernacle and by the altar round about, and their cords and all the instruments of their service, and all that is made for them, so shall they serve. So they handled all the fabrics, curtains, hangings, all of that stuff, and everything that had to do with it. It'd be everything that they used for, for stitching and dyeing and all those things too. I assume they would take care of all that also. Verse 27, at the appointment of Aaron and his sons shall be all the service of the sons of the Gershonites in all their burdens and in all their service, and ye shall appoint unto them in charge all their burdens. So the priests were to designate who was to carry what is what it's saying there. This is the service of the families of the sons of Gershon in the tabernacle of the congregation, and their charge shall be under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. So Eleazar was a priest that was over the Kohathites, which carried all the holy furnishings of the tabernacle, the ark and all that stuff. Eleazar was in charge of that. He was a supervisor over them. Now, Ithamar, he was the overseer of the Gershonites and Merari also. And here we get into Merari now. Verse 29, as for the sons of Merari, thou shalt number them after their families by the house of their fathers. From 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, shalt thou number them. Everyone that entereth into the service to do the work of the tabernacle, of the congregation. And this is the charge of their burden, according to all their service in the tabernacle of the congregation. The boards of the tabernacle, they are the ones that had the heavy load. The boards of the tabernacle and the bars thereof and the pillars thereof and the sockets thereof. The boards and the bars were the vertical and horizontal framework that made the walls of the tabernacle and the pillars of the court round about the pillars also and their sockets and their pins and their cords with all their instruments and with all their service and by name ye shall reckon the instruments of the charge of their burden Ithamar the priest was to designate which one of them were to carry things and how they were to do it the charge of their burden but like I mentioned there, Merari had the heaviest load by far. This is the service of the families of the sons of Merari, according to all their service in the tabernacle of the congregation under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Now, another thing, <laughs> another spiritual insight into all this. Uh, I was thinking about how in the New Testament, Paul compared the temporary nature of the tabernacle to our bodies. Remember that? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul said, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is 
the tabernacle. Now, there is no earthly tabernacle or temple anymore. We are the tabernacle. Each one of us is the tabernacle and the temple of the Lord in this world. And that's what Paul's talking about there. As Christians, it's hard for us really to imagine what it would have been like then if we didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the direction of the Lord in our lives personally. It's hard to imagine what that would be, you know, but that's how it was then. And the tabernacle was not their bodies then. It was this separate thing here, this physical thing that they carried. In the last chapter, all of the Levites of each of the three families that were a month old and upward of the men were numbered. Now, this is a smaller amount here. This is only those that are between 30 and 50. So it gives us the number here of that smaller group. Verse 34, And Moses and Aaron and the chief of the congregation numbered the sons of the Kohathites after their families and after the house of their fathers. From 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, everyone that entereth into the service for the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. And those that were numbered of them by their families were 2,750. Okay? Now I'm going to show this diagram again that I showed in the last video of the encampment here. Now notice that the number of all the Kohathites, all the male Kohathites that were a month, and, a month old and older, was 8,600. Now here, the ones that are numbered between 30 and 50 are less than a third of that. 2,750. Wow. These were they that were numbered of the families of the Kohathites. All that might do the service in the tabernacle of the congregation, which Moses and Aaron did number according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. All right? And those that were numbered of the sons of Gershon throughout their families and by the house of their fathers from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, everyone that entereth into the service for the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, even those that were numbered of them throughout their families by the house of their fathers were 2,630. All right? Now, looking at the diagram here, the Gershonites, there were 7,500 men that were a month old and older. But those that were between 30 and 50 was only 2,630. And one thing I thought about here is just considering how many are those that are part of the church compared to those that actually do the service of it. Those that do the heavy lifting, that do the work and the ministry, the work of the Lord in the church is a small percentage of those that are actually part of it, you know? And we see that here. But I would assume that, uh, you know, after the tabernacle is set up, then these other Levites that are under 30 or over 50 would assist in things that needed to be done other than carrying everything, you know. Verse 41. These are they that were numbered of the families of the sons of Gershon, of all that might do service in the tabernacle of the congregation, who Moses and Aaron did number according to the commandment of the Lord. And those that were numbered of the families of the sons of Merari, throughout their families, by the house of their fathers, from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, everyone that entereth into the service for the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, even those that were numbered of them after their families were 3,200. There were more. Now, looking at the diagram here again, Merari was on the north side there. And look at their total. Their total was only 6,200. Okay? 6,200. 
But look at how many were between 30 and 50. That's over half. 3,200 of them were males between the ages of 30 and 50. Now, I think the reason that it wound up being more there was just, it was divine providence because they were the ones who were to carry the heavy things. They were to carry all the lumber, the bars and the boards and the pillars and things like that. Now, this wasn't known by them ahead of time, but it was known by the Lord. See? So that's why I say it was by divine providence there that they just happened to have more. There were more men between the ages of 30 and 50 in Merari than there were in Gershon or Kohath. Isn't that interesting? Verse 45. These be those that were numbered of the families of the sons of Merari, whom Moses and Aaron numbered according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Now, all those that were numbered of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron and the chief of Israel numbered after their families and after the house of their fathers from 30 years old and upward even unto 50 years old everyone that came to do the service of the ministry the service you know has a little bit of a military connotation to it you know and the service of the burden in the tabernacle of the congregation even those that were numbered of them were 8,504 score. That's 8,580. Well, we know that the total number of the Levite males over a month old was 22,000. We learned that in the last video. There was 22,000 total. Now here... We're seeing that those that were actually doing the heavy lifting, the ones between 30 and 50, were 8,580. Little over a third. Verse 49. According to the commandment of the Lord, they were numbered by the hand of Moses. Everyone according to his service and according to his burden. Thus were they numbered of him, as the Lord commanded Moses. Everything was done according to what the Lord commanded Moses, you know, in all of this. And that's the end of chapter 4. Now, in looking at this diagram here, consider the ratio difference between the number of fighting men compared to those appointed to the service of the Lord. In all the tribes the number that's given here in the diagram of each of the tribes is the number of fighting men remember the ones that were able to go into battle those that were 20 and older you know those who were able to bear arms that's the numbers that we're seeing in the diagram here now think of that number there that were able-bodied between the ages of 30 and 50 that were to do the service of the tabernacle compared to the fighting force of Israel. The smallest tribe there of the 12, we can see, is Manasseh. Manasseh had 32,200 men that were able to bear arms and go to war. And that's the smallest number of the 12. But yet Levi only had 8,580 that would be comparable with that, like fighting men. that They were able to bear the tabernacle and everything that went with it when they moved. Because that was equal. That was considered like the same as going into battle in a way. But what a huge difference. Because if you add up those fighting men of all of them, and I think altogether maybe close to 600,000. I think it was. I think the total was over 600,000 compared to the, the ones that were to carry the things of the Lord was only 8,580. Another thing that I thought of in going through this 
is that appointment to the service of the Lord back then, whether it was in the battle or carrying the things of the tabernacle, whatever it was, it was all physical things that they were doing. And that's it right there. The appointment to the service of the Lord back then was all in the flesh and it was by heredity. Right? It had to do with what families they were with and, you know, whether they were a Levite or, or whatever. Th these weren't these weren't spiritual appointments then, really. They had to do with heredity and the flesh. It's not like that now, is it? The appointments in the service of the Lord now is of the Spirit. It's not of the flesh at all. It has nothing to do anymore with physical heredity. It doesn't matter what family you're from physically here in this world whether or not you're eligible to do the service of the Lord. It has to do with who's called. Right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for showing us these different things from your word, Lord, and opening up your word to us. And Lord, we just thank you that we're able to do things by the Spirit now. And not just purely by heredity and by the flesh. Lord, we thank you for opening up these great and precious gifts to us because that's what they are. Lord, we give you all the honor and all the glory. Do your name. I ask that anybody listening here that doesn't know you would be drawn into your word and drawn into your love. And I thank you for it. And we give you all the glory in all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All righty. This is pretty secluded where I'm at here. I'm down an embankment, and Buttonbush Lake is behind me there. The access road is up at the top of the hill up here. And during the video, I could see cars going by once in a while that were coming into the nature preserve. So I'm not that far from my car here. And I walked all over the park to find this spot. I walked miles until I settled on this spot. And like I said, I just, I go to where the Lord leads me, you know, in my earthly tabernacle, right? Carrying all my gear and everything. And I take it to where the Lord designates set up here. And then that's what I do. Don't you just love the Word of God? It is like a living parable. It really is. I've said that before. But it is. All these things, uh, if we just look at them on the surface, it seems boring and monotonous. It's like, oh, all these numbers. and You know, it just seems so repetitive and everything. But when you really look at it and, and you allow the Holy Spirit to show you these things, that are hidden beneath the surface, boy, it can open up a lot to us. Amen. And I'll see you. I guess it'll be... Actually, I'll see you in a few days because I'm going to be doing a World Harvest Magazine video this weekend. It seems to work better doing those on the weekend. So I think I'll keep doing it that way. And... I'll see you then, and then we'll be back at the beginning of next week for Numbers chapter 5. I love you all, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.